The rest of us, let's take our Bibles and turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and you could stand when you find your place in the Bible. There's some Bibles nearby you and a chair if you need one. We want you to see what God says in His Word. And so let's read a couple of places in the New Testament. We're only going to read a single verse in two of the books and just two verses in one other. And I want to speak to you on a subject called, Are You Helping or Hurting the Church? Are you helping or hurting your church? Let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 18. Verse number 18, we read, Wherefore, Paul is, of course, writing to the church at Thessalonica. We've been studying in our adult Bible study lately. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Go to, back to Romans 15. Just turn back to the left in your Bible a few books. And you'll come to the great book of Romans. Go to chapter 15, verse number 22. Verse number 22. Paul says these words, For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming unto you, or to you. Now, one final passage in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, Paul's last uh, inspired letter to this young pastor, Timothy. Chapter 4 and verses 14 and 15. 2 Timothy 4, verses 14 and 15. We read these words. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou aware or aware also... For he hath greatly withstood our words. Let's pray together. Our God and Father, we love you and we love your church. And we know you love your church. And so God, we want our church to prosper. We want to see all your churches here in our country and worldwide to prosper. And yet, Lord, we're living in a hard time and churches are hurting. And so God, I pray that you'd help us realize our part in helping our church in helping all the churches that you love. Bless the message now, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, be seated. Your very presence here today, and especially that of our committed members, proves that you care about this church. And anything that you care about, who or what you care about, you do things for. You help those things you care about, you would never want to hurt them. Sadly, churches in America and in many other countries of the world are hurting more than ever. Our church would be no exception to that. Yes, COVID, as you know, for the last year and a half, COVID has hurt the churches. Not only that, but we can say that a culture, especially here in Western society, Uh, Our culture is turning away more and more from God, and so the churches are hurting for lack of people's interest. But I do not think that people or circumstances outside the church are hurting the churches as much as inside the church. Those who are either a part or who were once a part of the church. I think Christians, at least those who would name themselves as Christians, including you and I, are most to blame for the dismal condition in many churches today. Isn't it amazing that Peter would write in 1 Peter 4 that judgment must begin at the house of God. That means God holds people in His churches, Christians, to a higher standard than anyone else. Now, I do believe, and it's sad to say it, but I've witnessed it so often, that there is a lack of ecclesiology, of the proper view of ecclesiology, which is a big word that theologians give, to the doctrine of the church. What people believe about the church. 
and what part it should have in the Christian life and how you and I are to uh, be involved in it, how it's to operate and so on. I think there is a, a weakened and lesser view of ecclesiology than perhaps any other time in, in Christian history. And that is why the churches are hurting more and more. Now this message is brought to show all of us how we can either be helping or hurting our, cho- our church. And the points that I'll give will contrast one another. In other words, I won't have to give you the other side of each one. If I give you how we're helping the church, if you're not doing that, you're hurting the church. If you're hurting the church in one way, that means in that way you're not helping the church. I've got to say right up front that Jesus loves His church. Do you know it says in Acts 20 and 28, Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. He loves His church. I love the church. I hope you love the church. Jesus said one time when the apostles had witnessed him cleansing the temple in John chapter 2. He quoted from the Old Testament book of Psalms. He said, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That's a quote from the Psalms, which means his great passion for the church just consumed him. That when he saw the corruption in the temple, he had to do something about it. I wonder if we have that passion for the Lord's church like Jesus did. Do you know in his beautiful allegory known as Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan, the old writer, who himself pastored a little church that met in, of all places, a little barn. That's really what it was. It was a barn in Bedford, England, where he would eventually be arrested and taken away from and put in jail for not taking a license and where he would write that great allegory Pilgrim's Progress. But you know, during the writing of that great allegory, you know what he called the church? I love this. And remember where he was meeting in a little barn with about 25, 30 people most of the time. He called it the Palace Beautiful. (laughs) I love that, that analogy. He called the church where the people met in their assembly the Palace Beautiful. Well, I want to call your attention back to the three texts that I read for you this morning each of which refer to someone hurting the work that Paul and his fellow laborers were doing. And I want to state right up front, I hope you know this, but I have to remind you, that work was church work. Paul's work was not disenfranchised from or disconnected from the church. It was church work. He was a missionary pastor. He wrote to churches. He wrote to pastors like Timothy and Titus and included many of the workers in these churches. And as we looked at those three passages I read, we saw three examples of people hurting or hindering, as the word was used in our King James translation, of hurting the Lord's church. First, it was Satan that was hindering the church. Wow, that's a pretty serious charge. You know that the, the devil wants to hinder any good church? We wonder why things happen the way they do in our church or many other churches in the world. Why do we read of things that happen even in good churches? Because there's a real devil and he hates the church and he was hindering the church then. Now the second passage I read, it did not give a name. It just said someone was hindering Paul from coming to that church at Rome. And then the third one, there was a man named Alexander. And Paul, in a very harsh tone, says, the Lord remember him. He opposed Paul's words and his work. Do you know, it was very like Paul to write about those who were hurting the work of the ministry. He thought that a very serious charge. In 1 Timothy 1, in verse 19, he writes about a couple other ones. This may be the same guy, Alexander, here could be a different one. But he says, holding faith, talking about these people, and a good conscience which having, have, uh, some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. He said some people have given up their faith and become shipwrecked. And he says, Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Wow, that's a pretty serious thing. In Galatians 5, Paul wrote the same thing about those who hurt the work of the Lord in some very, very harsh terms. He says... In Galatians 5, 8, this persuasion, people were being persuaded to give up on the gospel of grace and go off into some false teaching of works. He says, this persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And then in verse 12, I would that they were even cut off which trouble you. Wow. Well, we might think, 
Is it possible to hurt the church? We're going to talk about helping or hurting the church today. Is it possible to hurt the church? Uh, doesn't the Bible say of the church, and the first time it's ever mentioned, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? It does say that. But that's not talking about an individual assembly. That's talking about the church in, a, in concept. Not one particular congregation, but all kinds of congregations that would be of that type. That the ecclesia, the called out assembly. He wasn't saying that individual churches couldn't go bad. They could. And, they, and they're hurt, and, and sometimes they split, and they die, and, and they close the doors. It happens all the time. It's happening in huge, huge numbers here in our country today. Jesus said to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2.5, listen to what He said, Remember therefore from whence or where thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. They had some problems. They had left their first love. He said, you better get back to where you were or else, that's a serious charge, or else, I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Symbolic language, the candlestick is the church. I'm going to remove you as a church. Our church, every good and godly church, needs the help of its people. I want to give you some ways today that you can help this church. First of all, number one, you can help it by coming to it. <laughs> It's not going to be deep today. It's not going to be deep. It's just going to be some reminders. Coming to it. You know the church, by definition, is an assembly. So any time you're missing from any service, friend, member especially, I'm talking to, but anybody who faithfully attends here, the church is hurt by that. Watching and listening to a service online will never replace assembling with God's people. We're living at a time now because of COVID and because of live streaming, and we're doing it right now. Many of our people will be watching this uh, justifiably so if they're sick or shut in or whatever by way of our Facebook or our website. But it cannot and should never replace coming to the church. The church is called a, a, an ecclesia, a call out assembly. And you cannot replace assembly by watching or listening. Remember the passage in Hebrews 10 about assembling? Let me read you the whole passage. You kind of get more of the context. In Hebrews 10 and 24, Paul, I think, was the writer, said, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. That's interesting. He said, let's consider each other, Christians, members in the church, in an assembly situation, consider each other to provoke, to, to emulate, to motivate each other to love and good works. Then he says, not forsaking, that means if you do forsake, you're not provoking to love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. That's a famous verse about needing to assemble. And we do. He said, don't forsake the times your church assembles. But I must read verse 26 as well because I think it goes with it. Because he goes right into for. The word for is like therefore or wherefore. It connects at least something previous to it. For if we sin willfully. Wow. I wonder what sin he's talking about. Right after verse 25. Could it not be the sin of not forsake, or, 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 or forsaking yourself in the assembly? He told us not to. And he says if we sin willfully. After that we have received the knowledge of the truth. There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. No doubt that verse has deeper ramifications for sure, but I have to believe he's saying, we are not to forsake our assembly. Now, I know what you're going to say, and I'm just going to play devil's advocate and I'll speak for you. You'll say, Pastor, I can't come to every service. We have services four times a week. Let me say this as kindly but as firmly as I can. I love every one of you in this room. And some I don't know, but I have no reason not to love you either. You could if you wanted to. You could come to every service if you really wanted to. You know why I know that? You could come to every day of work you want to. You could go to the store every time you need to. You can cut your grass every time it needs it. You and I can do what we really want to do. Is that not true? Everybody does. We all do what we want to do. But you might say, Pastor, wait a minute, there's just too many services and, and too much to do here. Well, let me remind you of the early church. The early church in the book of Acts. Do you know that they met daily? 
Now, we have a Wednesday night service, as you know, a midweek Bible study and prayer time. We have three, technically three services we meet for every Sunday. And people say, that's too many services. Well, if we want to, want to really be biblical as far as following the New Testament churches and their pattern, they met every day. Acts 2.47 says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, how do you add to an assembly daily if you're not meeting in some way daily? Well, we get that further confirmed from Acts 5.42, where the text says, And daily in the temple and in every house they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. And then the very next verse, it's a chapter division, but chapter uh, 6, verse 1, adds another little indication that they met every day. In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the uh, Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. <laughs> daily ministering. And so the church met many times. Now, what is the trend in our day? The trend among churches today is to meet less, not to meet more. You know how many times people pop in our Wednesday night service back there at the fellowship hall or call on the phone at the church or email me and say, do you have a Wednesday night service or do you have a Sunday night service? I just have to direct them to the website. It says that, but they're shocked in a way. They're like, well, I'm glad you do. And we often have even members of other churches that come here on Wednesday night and sometimes occasionally on a, on a Sunday night, but mainly Wednesday, because they can't find another church that is open on Wednesday. So as that trend becomes more and more of not having services, I have to say it's, it's a cop-out. It's a cop-out. It is a sell-out to the people's whims. You say, well, we don't have, most of those churches would justify not having service. And I'm not necessarily just blaming the leaders who have canceled these other services because I know, I know the temptation. I've been tempted to, believe me. I've had literally people in our church say to me, preacher, why do we have a Wednesday night service? We only have a handful of people that show up. Why do we have a Sunday night service? Literally, there's been some people, I don't think anybody still here said that, but there's been a few over the, is it worth having a service preacher for 10 people? I don't want us to cop out to the society. Here a lady wrote in a magazine these words called, I voted to close the church. Last Sunday I voted to close the church, not intentionally, but carelessly, thoughtlessly, lazily, indifferently I voted. I voted to close its doors, that its witness and its testimony might be stopped. I voted to close the open Bible on its pulpit. For you see, I could have gone and I should have gone, but I didn't. So by not going, I voted to close the church last Sunday. I couldn't argue with what she just said. I'm amazed at church signs. Uh, sometimes I, I don't think people watch what they're putting on their signs. I told you about a sign that's close to my house that for many, many months it had just a contradiction in terms. Here's, here's a story I read or a little article about a church sign somebody wrote in about. Here's what one side of a marquee sign said at a church. This church is the gateway to heaven. Well, that sounds good. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with that. They have the way to heaven. They teach Christ. Guess what it said on the other side, though, if you were coming the other direction? Close for the summer. Close for the summer. That means somebody can get to heaven during the summer. You better wait to fall. If it wasn't so disgraceful, it'd be funny, wouldn't it? Do you know when you're gone from church, our church suffers? We miss your encouragement. He just said about not forsaking, encouraging one another as you see, them, see the day approaching. We miss your encouragement. We also miss your support. Just your support of being here. How about your service? Someone has to do for you when you're not here. Do you know it hurts the prospects of, of visitors that come to a church? No doubt. We have a few visitors here. Today. I'm just going to lay it out to you honestly. It hurts the prospect of visitors when you're not here. It hurts when any of us are gone. I have to be gone a few Sundays a year. I, I'm not against anybody taking a vacation a few Sundays a year. I do. I try to keep it to two Sundays as much as possible. I don't think I've ever missed more than two in a year. Because I know that even the church hurts when I'm not here. 
I need to be. I want to be here. Anytime people are gone, the church is hurt. Now, you can help this church by coming to every service. You can. I'm just giving you legitimate, logical, tangible ways for you to help your church. Come every time the doors are open. You can help it by joining your church. Show your love for your church. You know the worst way you can hurt your church? It's under this idea of coming to it, is leaving your church. People leave churches. I just got done writing a book that I just told you is done, and the church was so kind and generous to forward the money to publish this book. It's out on the table uh, for you if you want to take one, and if you're willing to help us cover some costs, because we need to try to make that up, and I'm going to be selling it to make up the cost. But let me just say this. The, the most hurtful thing a person can do to a church is to leave it. But it happens all the time. Happens all the time. I read something in a church magazine, church uh, periodical that I get, and I thought it was very interesting. 90% of new members will stay in a church if, and it gives you three reasons. I like these. I'm going to read them to you. Three ways in which you can keep, 90% of new members stay if you can do number one, they can articulate their faith implies their need for membership and evangelism class. In other words, if people, new, new people in a church, new members, really understand what that church believes and it's their same beliefs and they can articulate those, they're liable to stay put. Number two, they belong to some subgroup, whether it's a Bible study, a Sunday school, a choir, or some area of service. I think that's a good one. I think that's very true. And number three, they have at least four to eight close friendships within the church. I thought those are right on. They're just spot on for the truth. I found that people over the years who get plugged into a church like ours who do those three things. They know why they're here. They know what they believe. They agree with the beliefs of this church. That's why they come here and stay here. And they get plugged into some ministry and they make some connections among the people. They are the ones that stay. I've got to move on because I've got four or five other areas to cover quickly. Not only, first of all, here's how you help your church coming to number two, serving in it. Serving in it. You know, the Christian life, friends, is about serving Christ. It is. It's not about just having your sins forgiven in mind. It's not about making us happy. It's not about just taking us to heaven one day. It's about us living for and like Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. And he was the one that the scripture says, uh, he went about doing good. He went about doing good. In John 12 and verse 25, Jesus said this, He that loseth his life shall, uh, or I'm sorry, he that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. Then he goes right into this. I think it's, it's in his thinking, this is part of how you keep your life. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. In chapter 13, as Jesus sat in the upper room with the disciples on the night before his crucifixion, in these marvelous words in chapter 13, he said this, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Paul picks up on that great theme of Christian service in Romans 6 and 18, and he says this, Being then made free from sin, that's a Christian, we're made free from sin through conversion, ye became the servants of righteousness. In verse 22, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. Now, why is it so important to be serving in your church? How does it help? Why does it help so much? Well, first of all, number one, because the laborers are so few. The work is so great and the laborers are few. Jesus said in those monumental words in Matthew 9, 
The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. Not only that, not only is the, is the labor or the laborers few, but the cause is worth it. The cause is worth it. Hey, when, when you're motivated and, and pled with and begged to serve God at your church, hey, it's not without any consequences to you. The consequences are great. It's worth it. It's worth it to serve Christ. It's worth it to serve in His church. The benefits are going to far outweigh whatever you put into it. And then lastly, we can say, the reward will be great. Hey, the labors are few. It's worth it. And the rewards are going to be great. Jesus said in that parable one day, the servant who multiplied his talents, he was told by the master, well done, thou good and what? Faithful servant. Do you know the church suffers for lack of helpers? Ministries are lacking or not even started. Things get left undone. I have people come to me and have had over the years I've been at this church and other churches. And I'm not just pinpointing this church. This is in every church I've been a part of. You have people come and say, Pastor or staff, uh, so, something over here doesn't look right. Why, why, is, that, why is that not done? Or why, why isn't that being taken care of? Why don't we do this? Or do we have this? I don't know how many times, and, and I know they mean, well, I'm not saying this against any of the people. I, I would say the same if I was visiting church. I'll have people come up and say, do you have this for the youth? Do you have this for the kids? I'll say, not right now. Because it takes workers. It takes people serving. Those things don't just happen. They're not just like osmosis. You have to plan and you have to have people working and serving. You know, we've went through a period of almost a year and a half now with COVID where for much of that time, a handful of faithful people kept these buildings and properties up. I've got to tell you, a handful, literally. There was times during the dark part of COVID where we'd have five people show up for work day. Thank God for our friends, the Smiths, taking care of the grass. That was one thing off of our plate. We'd have a handful of people cleaning two big buildings, taking care of person on two big buildings. Do you know, if you're not serving, someone else vacuumed the floor you walked on this morning. Someone else cleaned the sink you washed your hands in today. Someone else taught your kids or grandkids in the class they went to. Someone else practiced the music that you enjoyed or sang with them. Friends, it, it, it's commitment. It takes so much service. And sometimes we, we kind of like, we like to play a balancing act when it comes to serving in the church. We think, if I'm doing one thing, I don't have to do the other. If I come to one service, I don't have to come to the other. I don't know where we ever got that. You couldn't, you couldn't pull that off at work. In your family, that won't work. You can't say to your spouse, hey, I did this for you today, so I don't have to do the rest of being a good spouse. Or you can't go to your boss at work and say, hey, I did that job, but I don't have to do the other jobs, do I? No, they're going to say you have to do all that's in part, part of being an employee. We've got to realize it's a multifaceted ministry, even in a small church like ours. One, one person wrote, and this is kind of a comical little thing, but I liked it. It says, there are four main bones in every organization. Kind of like a skeleton, you know, bones. The wish bones, wishing somebody would do something about the problem. The jaw bones, doing all the talking but very little else. The knuckle bones, those who knock everything. <laughs> and thank God for the back bones, those who carry the brunt of the load and do most of the work. Well, you know, I, I've gotten to, sadly, I've had to, but I, I'm just being real transparent and honest with you on this. I've had to get to where I just can't wait for volunteers. I just have to approach you. I've always told you that we put out a plea for volunteers. And if I don't get volunteers, now I just go to you. And I thought about that. I, it really was a struggle to get to this point, but I thought I, I had no choice. And I, I kind of thought about it back to a, a, a boss, back to your job. If a, if a boss is to approach his employees and say, can I have any volunteers to go clean that dumpster out or mop those floors or change those light bulbs or take out the trash. 
and nobody raises their hand. What does he do? Does he say, well, I guess the trash doesn't get taken out, the dumpster doesn't get clean, whatever. No, you know what he does? Sorry, you got to do it. You got to do it. Can you do it? That's what he does. And so I've had to literally come to people and just say, hey, we, we need your help. Can you do this? And thank God I've had very good responses. And maybe sometimes there's people that just don't know they are needed. But serving in your church is such a great, great need. Number three, third way you can help your church. Coming to it, serving in it, giving to it. Giving to it. Do you know everything you and I care about, we give to. We give to. Jesus used this analogy. It's a beautiful analogy in the Sermon on the Mount. He said in Matthew 7, 9, Or what man is there of you, whom if his son asks bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he asks a fish, will he give him a serpent? He's using just hyperbole, I mean, exaggeration. We know the answer. No father would do that. Because everything you love, everyone you love, you give to. When we love the Lord's church, we help it by our giving. Do you know how we've been able to make some of these nice improvements we've made in our church in the last six months or so? By the way, we just finished our last set of bathrooms. If you haven't been down there to the fellowship hall out that way, those bathrooms now are complete. We've, we've, we've redone every one of the stalls and all six of our restrooms here and have them looking good. You've got to keep this building almost 40 years old. It'll be 40 years old next year. It's built in 1982. We've got to keep up. You know how we've been able to do that? The only way that's been possible. Hey, we had this... This whole platform redone about two, two, three months ago. Remember that? All kinds of other little things we've done. It takes money. It doesn't happen free. We have talented people. We hire contractors. People come out here and do it. We do it ourselves, some of it. But it still takes money. We've been able to do that because we've had people who are faithfully giving. And yet, like always has been the case in, this, in every church, there's always people who don't give in a church like this. Imagine if every member tithed and gave to missions, we would never have a financial problem. Help your church by giving to your church. Number four, here's a great one. Here's another way you can help your church. Loving the members of it. Loving the members. Nothing helps a church more than for the members to reach out and love each other. Spend time with one another. Man, I love to hear, I'll hear stories of people that are getting together, doing something outside of church, their fellowship, they're going somewhere together, whatever, they're having each other over or whatever. That's, that encourages every preacher because that's what part of the church is, loving one another, spending time. Hey, invite somebody over. You know, that's a great idea. Just in, if you want to have fellowship, some, some people will say, and I've had people come to our church and say they really need fellowship, they're starving for fellowship. The best way for you to get fellowship is invite people over to your house. Because I tell you what they'll do. They'll invite you back. And then it'll continue a relationship that may just go on from there. Invite, it, should, it takes hospitality. It does. You've got to open your home. You've got to maybe make a meal. You've got to clean up a little bit, whatever it takes. But that's what part of loving each other. See, we help each other in the church. That's how we love. We help each other when there's special needs. How blessed I was. He's not here. He had to leave for work. I wish he'd be here when I give this story, but... He knows how blessed he was by it. Our friend Samson just moved into a, an apartment here. He really went through a tough time in his life. And I found out that our friend Charles and a few people helped him. They went and rented a, a U-Haul truck and took him over a new set of bedroom furniture or something like that. And he had a need. And, and, and there wasn't anybody that had a truck at the time. And they just rented a U-Haul and did it. I, I said, praise God for that. That's what we do when we love each other. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by your love one to another. That's what Jesus said. Hey, I'll tell you another way we love each other is by forgiving each other and being humble and being willing to reconcile when we've offended each other because you're going to be offended or offend. I'll guarantee it. In church, it won't be long till you get offended or you do offend. And if we're not willing to apologize and sit down face to face and reconcile, then we are not showing any love and a church won't be able to continue. It'll be hurt. It'll be hurt. Paul said in Ephesians 1 and 15, Wherefore also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints... Your love unto all the saints. He said in Hebrews 6 and verse 10 these words, 
For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. He said to these Hebrew believers, generally, it's a general circle, a circle epistle. It's not a particular church, but all believers at that time. He's saying, God's not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward His name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. You did it in the past, you're doing it now. I like that. That's how we help our church, by loving the body of Christ, the members. Number five, I'm hastening on, telling others about it. You want to you really help your church? One of the greatest ways you can help your church is tell others about it. I always want to refer to our church as evangelistic. Because I don't think any church really deserves to exist if it's not trying to get out the gospel. Evangelist means giving out the evangel, the good news. You're giving out, you're spreading the good news in your community. And we are doing that and trying to do that in many ways. And we're doing it in in what we call cold visiting type ways. We're putting tons of cards out. We're making new move-in calls where we're at least leaving a letter, a new move-in special letter on people's doors because people are just not opening their doors. I mean, never again after COVID, I don't know. We're using social media. We we have a podcast that we're doing. We do Facebook and our, our website. We have a YouTube channel as well. We're doing all that. But you know the best thing, you all those we're going to keep doing, but the best way you can help your church is for you to invite someone to church. I'm amazed how few visitors we have that are invited by our own people. I, I don't understand it. I don't know whether people are afraid to invite them. Maybe they're embarrassed of their church. I don't know what it is. I wish I did. But the best way you can show your love and help your church is to invite people to come. And I've always promised you this, if you will, We'll give them the word of God when they're here. We're going to try to give them the gospel. We'll do all we can. And as you invite them, here's just a couple little tips. Pick them up if they say they can't make it or they don't have a car or they're whatever. Just say, oh, come on. Uh, Kate and Jeff used to bring uh, Mrs. Joan Bott. She, when they knew Joan Bott was down here at an assistant living home and she couldn't come herself, they brought Joan. And I thank them for that, but let me use this illustration. Joan Bott never met a person she didn't talk to about Christ. She's a preacher's wife for many years. Her husband, Fred, was a great church planner and evangelist. But I was around Joan Bott when I worked at the church in Weatherford. She was a member out there. And she used to be such an inspiration to all of us. There's not a person she ever met, whether it was a restaurant, whether it was where she was living at that assisted living home, whether wherever she was, she began to talk to people about the Lord. You know, do whatever you can to spread the good news, the gospel, and invite people to your church. Like our Facebook. You ought to be on our Facebook page. we got a lot going on on there. It's, it's really looking good. We put all our services on there, a lot of other things advertised on there. Like, 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 all that, because it spreads out to other people. I read something about the, the Zulu churches in South Africa that I thought was exciting. I love this. It said it's a custom among the Zulu churches in Africa that as soon as they hear a sermon and leave the building, they go tell as many people as they can find to listen to what they just heard. I said, wish to God we had more people in our church would do that. Even tell them what the message was. Not even, not even if they can remember the point, just tell them about what was preached. Tell them about what we believe. Tell them, come and see. Come and hear. Come and be a part of it. Telling others about it. Man, helping your church. Last way, and it's by no means the least, it's probably the greatest. Praying for it. Praying for it. I told our people in our study of 2 Thessalonians last week, we were studying the last chapter in 2 Thessalonians 3, and I love what Paul said. He said, finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Paul never asked any, anybody for anything except for prayer. That's the only thing he ever asked for. I mean, he had a lot of needs. You study his life and see all he went through and all he suffered. I mean, he had all kinds of things he could ask for. He could have had a wish list longer than anyone else, but he never did. The only thing Paul ever asked for, for people who, who knew him and people involved in the work of Christ, pray, pray, pray for me. That's what we need for this church. Pray for him. Now again, there's six things up on that screen I'm seeing and you're seeing. 
Let's not do what I told you before. We can't say, okay, I'm doing number three. Forget the other five. No. They all, they're a package deal. This is how you help your church. Coming to it, serving in it, giving to it, loving the members of it, telling others about it, praying for it. Pray consistently for your church every day. Come to some of our prayer meetings. We literally have three times you can be a part of our prayer collectively as a church. Tuesday mornings, our ladies meet. 10 o'clock back here in the fellowship hall. It's a blessing to every time I see them. Every time I see their car out there. And I know not everybody can do that. That's okay. But if you can, come. Come, ladies. Join those. There's five or six women to meet there every Tuesday morning. Wednesday night, we have what we call a Bible study and prayer meeting. And it's a prayer meeting because we pray. Part of that service, we take requests. takes usually about the first half of the service. And we have several at least pray. Sometimes we'll break up into groups occasionally. Pray in, in groups. We pray as a church. And then every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock here in the old choir room back here, a handful of guys, we had probably five or six this morning that joined us. We pray. We want you to be a part of those. But even if you can't be part of one of those, you should be praying every day for your church. Now, let me end by saying, I haven't spoken about anything deep or new today, have I? Nothing in this message was meant to Wow, you into some new thing you've heard. No, it was meant to be a reminder. We all need reminders. How many times does the Bible say the word remember or remembrance? You look it up. You tell me how often. Because God knew our nature. Our nature is to easily let things pass, to just to forget, to, to kind of to, to get back into our comfort zone of thinking everything's okay. If we don't hear about it, everything, no news is good news. <laughs> That's the way all think. Not always. See, your church needs your help more than ever before. I'm, I'm burdened about the future, not only of this church. Yes, I'm directly involved in this ministry. But I'm burdened about the future of our churches, really worldwide, but especially in America. Man, I'll tell you, COVID has exposed the weaknesses in our churches more than anything else. And I think God used it. I didn't, I'm not saying God brought COVID purposely. I, I leave that to him. He either brings everything or allows everything, right? So he allowed it if he didn't bring it. And he allowed it to show how weak so many churches are. Churches are hurting. Man, you ask missionaries. I talk to them. We've had some of them in here. I sat and meet with them. I talk with them. They'll tell me how hard it is to even get in a church. How hard it is to get support. Churches are tapped out financially. Can't support any more missionaries. And it all is unraveling around us. Because friends, it's time to step up. It's, it's time to get involved. Help your church. Because this church, as well as every church, every good sound church that loves God, loves the Bible, trying to make a difference, they need help. And without help, we're never going to get anywhere. Think about that. Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I know you love this church. I know the people of our church that are here, that are members especially, I know they love this church or they wouldn't be here. And no one would purposely ever hurt this church or anyone or anything they love. I know that. But sometimes, as I said, it's, it's just human nature to let things slide, to let things kind of gravitate towards a direction they shouldn't. It takes to be stirred sometimes. Peter wrote about stirring up our remembrance in 2 Peter 1. So this invitation is really an invitation about stirring up your remembrance. First of all, members, you that are members of our church and, and even faithful attenders. We have some that haven't joined yet. I've talked to most everybody that comes to this church faithfully about joining. And even if you haven't joined yet, we consider you part of this work. We want to see you take that next step of membership. But we need help. There's so much more that our church could do. And, and I want to see our church do. Hey, our future is totally dependent on you. God's going to bless, but He only blesses as we obey His will. He doesn't bless despite ourselves. He blesses when we follow Him. And so after I pray, we're going to stand to our feet and we're going to have a time of invitation where each of us can just think about what was said. I know there's a visitor or two here and I didn't really preach to them, but I hope they understood the, 
the principle I'm trying to get across and then we'll understand that we love our church and we want to see it grow and we want to see it do more. And, and maybe God led uh, a visitor here for that reason. Just con contemplate how all churches need their help. So after I pray, we'll stand to our feet. You'll have an opportunity to respond to the message today in any way that God has revealed to you. Our Father, our God, we thank you for your church that you created, Lord Jesus, in the days of your ministry on earth with the apostles and those early churches. And now we are the beneficiaries all these centuries later of the work they did. It was their valiant courage and effort that made it possible for there to be churches still today, some 2,000 years ago. We know your hand's been upon them. They didn't do it in human strength or ingenuity. They did it by your power and strength. And Lord, now we're in dark times and hard times and, and our country has turned away from you and God has been kicked out of the public square. COVID has exposed weaknesses in churches where people now are just satisfied to sit home in their pajamas and watch church or turn, turn it on the TV or on their computer or their phone. God, I pray, help us to get a conviction of, for ecclesiology, your love for the church. Your, the church is your church. Lord, this is your church. We didn't start it. It's not ours, it's yours. We're simply a part of it by your mercy and grace and love for us. And we're so privileged and thrilled to be a part of your work on earth. We want to see this church prosper. We need help. Call on our people to help, to get more involved, to serve more, to come more, to pray more, to give more, to get to be a part of loving each other as a part of this body. Lord, bless this invitation now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Let's have the music.